Good morning and welcome to Covenant's service of worship, whether you're joining us in person or online. Uh, we're glad to have you here with us this morning. For those here in the sanctuary, again, the bulletin is provided for you in the pews. Uh, please take that and use that. Um, and for those at home, the bulletin can be found in its usual place under the bulletins and services button on our website. Today we will be observing the Lord's Supper. The, the wafer and the juice should be provided in the little cups in the pews. Um, and for anyone who is needing gluten-free bread, that is available in the foyer, or you can ask one of the ushers who would be glad to provide that for you. Uh, we continue to ask those planning to attend in person to register uh, each week. That email goes out about middle of the week. And we thank you for the work you've been doing to continue to register and also at the end of the service to do a good job of filing out quickly so then we can gather uh, outside, um, out away from the building um, together after the service. Um, and we also want to remind everyone that masks uh, or face coverings are required to be worn inside the building. Um, and this not only complies with the ordinances that have been set for us by those in authority over us, but it's also one way that we can uh, promote the health and the safety of not only one another, but also our community. In the past few weeks, we've seen an increase in people coming to gather, which is great, um, and we want to see more. Uh, so we've had to tweak our seating just a little bit. We've opened some of the middle rows so then we can kind of group the couples and individuals together because we've had some families who either have to gather in the foyer because of seating. Um, so if you could, um, in the weeks ahead, uh, if you are singles or individuals or couples, uh, please look to fill some of those middle spaces so then we can leave some of the larger sections for larger families uh, in the weeks ahead. Uh, but we thank you for your cooperation to making it that we can get as many people uh, here in the building as possible. And we are also planning to hold the annual church picnic at the end of this month on Sunday uh, the 27th. Uh, there will be guidelines and there will be uh, precautions set in place. Those things are still being hashed out. But look for uh, an email coming in either this week or the week ahead to explain a little bit more of what that's going to look like. Um, and then finally, there was a misprint in the weekly email. The student ministries will not be gathering tonight, um, with it being a holiday weekend, uh, enjoy time with family or whatever else that you'd be doing. Um, but we will pick back up next week uh, as we continue our study in the book of Ruth. Our call to worship um, comes from Psalm 107. And we hear that the Lord has himself gathered us together. And then in it, he himself calls us to worship him. The psalm says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. And gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let us pray. All glorious God, we give you thanks. In your Son, Jesus Christ, you have given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You chose us before the world was made to be your holy people, to be blameless before you. You have adopted us as your children in Christ. You have set us free by his blood. You have forgiven us of our sin. And much more than you have given us your Holy Spirit, the seal and pledge of our inheritance. Triune God, you are good, and your steadfast love endures forever. All praise and glory be yours for the richness of your grace, for the splendor of your gifts, and for the wonder of your love. Would you receive our worship and praise this morning? even as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We have come this morning from various places, circumstances, and conditions, and yet we come united as the people of God, eager to proclaim his love and his goodness to us, his people. So let us then stand and sing our first two hymns. First come people of the risen king, followed by how great thou art.
please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Uh, <coughs> uh, the scripture reading this morning is 1 Peter verses <coughs> 1 Peter 1 verses 3 through 9. They can be found in your personal Bibles and also on page 3 of the bulletin. <coughs> The Apostle Peter spent the last decade of his life in Rome and was martyred uh, there uh, around 67 AD. Um, First Peter was written around 63 AD. The theme of this epistle is about suffering and God's grace and overcoming suffering. <clears throat> First Peter 1. Three through nine. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ, Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is irrepressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. May God <clears throat> bless the reading of his word to our understanding. Please be seated. Please pray along with me. <clears throat> I love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Merciful and loving Father, we come to you this morning for supplication for the various needs of those in this congregation, but also the needs of those around the world. <clears throat> we also come to you to thank you for answered prayers. We draw near to you, and when we do, you draw near to us. We lift up all those suffering in their physical bodies. Clay Peters was just released from the hospital. We thank you that he has recovered, but we pray that the strength he lost from the hospital stay will return soon. We thank you also that Ella Ann Peters is getting good results from her chemotherapy. And pray that the fatigue that she has as a result will resolve when she finishes. We pray also for Deborah Walsh. We also pray for all those listed in the bulletin, healing from or anticipating surgery, dealing with uh, cancer and other ailments, speed their healing and recovery and give them peace. We pray for all those who have lost loved ones in recent months. Comfort them as they mourn. Father, we especially ask for your mercy during this deadly and insidious pandemic to pass into history. Please help people everywhere to follow the safety guidelines to prevent spread. Please speed the delivery of, a safe, and, of safe and effective drugs and a vaccine. We pray for all those who serve our country in the military, especially those known to us and listed in the bulletin. Please protect them and help them to be a light to believers. We pray for the missionaries that 
we support financially and with our prayers in various parts of the world and here in the United States as well. Uh, they sometimes get discouraged uh, because progress is slow as they work for you and for the kingdom. And we just pray that you would encourage them day to day and um, that they would bring many to the Lord Jesus. We beseech you for uh, prosperity, prosperity materially and spiritually for all the ministries Covenant supports, especially the two newer ones, Caring Hearts and Deeper Still. Thank you, Father, <clears throat> for the lengthening list of PCA churches, church plants, and RUF ministries in Arkansas. Also, the church plants in Glasgow, Scotland, and Charlottesville, Virginia. Help them to grow numerically, but especially spiritually. Encourage all the pastors who labor for the growth of your kingdom through Jesus Christ. We ask you for your blessing on this service of worship and Pastor Call's sermon. All these things we pray in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would take your bulletin and at the top of page four, we will confess our faith uh, together using the words from Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. Let us confess our faith. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Amen. Please join me in a prayer of thanksgiving. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to worship together today as a body of Christ, both in person and online. We thank you for the health and protection of our congregation and staff, and we pray for the healing for those struggling with illnesses. Thank you, Father, for the changing of the seasons, for the cooler weather ahead, kids going back to school, and the many signs that your sovereign hand is at work in our world every day. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of music and the joy we find when we use it to worship you. We thank you for our music team and that they've been able to continue to provide leadership and worship during difficult times. Finally, Father, we thank you for the material blessings you've provided and the opportunity we have to give some of it back to you today. Please bless our offerings so they're used for the advancement of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Please remain seated as we sing, There is a Redeemer.
Christ is our Redeemer, and part of the work that his Spirit continues to work in us as people is our sanctification. He desires to make us more holy, to make us more like himself. And a critical part of this work of the Spirit is him helping us to see, to confess, and to repent of our sin. Even as Tim preached a few weeks ago, to even learn to hate our sin. And so we do this as a part of our worship, week in and week out. We confess corporately, and we confess individually our sin before the Lord. So let us now confess our sin, first corporately, using the words found on the bottom of page 4 in your bulletin. Oh, my Savior, help me. I am slow to learn, prone to forget, and weak to climb. I am in the foothills when I should be on the heights. I am pained by my graceless heart, my prayerless days, my poverty of love, my sloth in the heavenly race, my sullied conscience, my wasted hours, my unspent opportunities. I am blind while the light shines around me. Take the scales from my eyes, grind to dust my heart of unbelief. Make it my highest joy to study you, meditate on you, gaze on you, sit like Mary at your feet, lean like John on your breast, appeal like Peter to your love, count like Paul all things but dung. I believe, help my unbelief. Amen. Amen. And having confessed your sins, our sins, both individually and corporately, hear these words of assurance from the prophet Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And in Christ we know and we rejoice that we have been washed as snow. The crimson stain of our sin has been removed by his perfect sacrifice. And so we have full assurance of this and all the promises that God has promised to us in Scripture. So let us respond then by standing and singing together blessed assurance.
please remain standing and open your Bibles or use the text printed in the bulletin and turn to Ezra chapter 3. Our passage will be looking at verses 8 through 13 of Ezra chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Now in the second year after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua with his sons and his brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Henadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the directions of the king of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. You may be seated. And together let us go to the Lord and ask his guidance as we seek to understand his word. Father God, we thank you for texts like these. A glimpse into what your people experienced thousands of years ago and seeing how it even relates thousands of years later for us today. May you guide us into all uh, wisdom and truth. May my words be true and accurate and clear. And may we be revived by your word this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Human beings everywhere love being together. We will look for pretty much any reason to get together. A birthday, a holiday, a sunny day, or any day. One American chef, chefs knowing a little bit more about gatherings of people, calls this the power of gathering. She says, there is this power of gathering. It inspires us delightfully to be more hopeful, more joyful, more thoughtful, in a word, more alive. Now, without trying to be too controversial, hasn't this reality been one of the more difficult parts of handling the ongoing pandemic. People love to be together. And I'm not sure how much we align with this idea of the power of the gathering, but whatever the case is, we want to gather together. College kids were hearing the reports coming out of the daily uh, governor's reports. They want to enjoy time with their roommates, their classmates, and their friends. Sports fans want to be able to go to the games to celebrate with people in the seats. Neighbors want to have cookouts and barbecues together to celebrate the end of summer, the beginning of another school year. Churches, we would like to be operating in normal ways. Large families, extended families with multiple generations yearn to get together, to be with one another. And this is what has made the personal and social effects of this pandemic so difficult. Gatherings are either not happening or they're significantly limited or different. This has added an element of of sorrow, even in the midst of joyful gatherings. Someone or some group of people cannot be there. This seems and has seemed to be the clearest when it comes to weddings and graduations, which many of you here know all too well. Yes, it is a great joy, and it was a great joy. There were two weddings uh, here at Covenant with the Covenant family to see couples exchange their vows or to see graduates receive their diplomas after years of hard work. 
But there was also a little bit of grief intermixed. Maybe a grandparent couldn't be there because of them being at risk of exposure. Or maybe a sibling, in the case of graduations, wasn't even invited at all. Maybe room for near and dear friends simply did not exist. Whatever the case, these special gatherings, typically meant for joy and celebration, carried with them a sense of sorrow, a this-should-not-be type of feeling. Our passage this morning in Ezra chapter 3 describes a very similar gathering. And while weddings and graduations are certainly great events, this one takes the cake. This is the first formal gathering of the Israelite people upon returning from exile back to the promised land. After being removed, forcibly so, from their homes for 70 years, the people of God finally go back home. No more are they worshiping in private, probably just as families. No more are they facing Jerusalem while being thousands of miles away. They are back in the land. And as expected, there is great joy and celebration as they gather. There is worship as the people begin putting the pieces of their lives back together. And maybe equally expected or entirely unexpected, there is also great mourning, weeping. Some cannot help but grieve as they begin putting the pieces of their lives back together. But in the midst of it all, serving as the kind of eye around which this storm of sorrow and joy is swirling is the confession of verse 11. It is the constant in this story, if you will. It is what unites this particular people gathering together. Whether in joy or in sorrow, the people of God gather to praise Him for His abundant goodness. And this same reality holds true for us this morning and each and every Sabbath morning that we gather Some of us come every single morning or certain mornings with great joy over the events of the past week, month, maybe even a year. Others of us come with great sorrow for the same reasons. Whatever the case, this passage from Ezra encourages us, each of us, individually and corporately as we gather together. God is good to his people, whether they're in times of joy or in times of sorrow. And we gather together in those times, mixed times of joys and sorrow, to exalt His name. There's two points this morning, only two points. First, we're going to look at the people worship, and then we're going to look at how the people weep. These two points are going to flow primarily out of verses 10 through 13. This is where we'll spend our time this morning. Verses 8 and 9 are important, though, as they help us to set the context for this formal gathering of the people of God. For up to this point in Ezra, we learn that under Cyrus of Persia, a pagan leader, the Israelites have been granted permission to go back home and rebuild their temple. Ezra 1 and Ezra 2 record this. And the first thing that they do when they get there in Ezra chapter 3 is they rebuild the altar. They desire to offer sacrifices to the Lord once again. And the first half, we didn't read it of chapter 3, is that successful project. They set up an altar, and they start making sacrifices on it. Naturally then, the next building project, if you will, is a new temple. The altar needs to be kept somewhere besides just out in the open. And so, as we read, in, starting in verse 8, the people begin actively engaged in the work of laying the foundation. And we see that everyone gets involved. The leaders get their hands dirty. Zerubbabel is a governor-like figure. He's leading the way in this building project. And the lay people follow after him. We also see the spiritual leaders getting involved. Jeshua is a Levite, likely the high priest at that time. And he rallies the rest of the priests and the Levites to help the project. And then from there, all the returnees who are able engage in laying the foundation for this new temple. And we find that they are successful. They are successful first in following the law. 
These supervisors that they position, they're not taskmasters driving people or cracking whips, but they're people who know the law. And their job is to see that, to oversee that the project is being done with ritual purity at each and every step. But Israel is not only successful in their purity as they build this foundation, they're also successful in that the job gets done. Not only is it true that many hands make light work, but united hands get the job done. We see in Ezra 3 verses 1 where it says, The people gathered as one man to Jerusalem, and this oneness continued right up and through the laying of the foundation in verses 8 and 9. So that's kind of the background, that's the setting before we jump into the gathering of the people in verses 10 through 13. Because once all that work is finished, once the altar is set up, once the foundation is laid, the community gathers again as returned Israelites to respond to the Lord for all that has taken place. And the first thing that we see again in verses 10 and 11 is that the people worship. The only right thing the people can do when they see the foundation laid and finished is praise the Lord together. And notice how this worship service, like the building project, is done by the book. It says that they came forward, it lists all these people, to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. This little phrase according to the directions of the king of Israel, is rather significant. We know from Israel's history, they have been anything but good at following directions, especially when it comes to worship. Israel was constantly tempted with outright defiance of the law or syncretism, which is the blending of the way God said he is to be worshipped with the way the nations worshipped. You may remember at the beginning of this year, seems like a long time ago, but Tim walked us through the law of instructions on worship in Deuteronomy 12. And then he also walked us through how that informs the way we worship today. I would encourage you over, the, over this course of this week, go back and listen to that in light of this text here. Because the right worship of the triune God is an important theme throughout the entire Old Testament and Scripture as a whole. We seek to do it by the book, because in it, God has told us exactly how he is to be worshipped. Worship is not something to be taken lightly or done haphazard. We worship in the manner we do out of reverence for the Lord, out of a desire to obey the instructions he has given us in Scripture. And in their very first gathering back in the promised land, the people of Israel get it right. The reference to David likely connects to 1 Chronicles 25, where David puts together the organization of those leading in worship, the musicians, the instrumentalists. He puts everyone together in order. The inclusion of the Levites, even their attire, the priests, the trumpets, the cymbal, all of that points back to the law and instructions given by Moses. And in fact, nearly every single detail in verse 10 points back intentionally to 2 Chronicles 5, where you remember, hopefully, Solomon, at the end of his temple, presents it to the people and dedicates it to the Lord. And that connection amplifies, then, this gathering of God's people here in Ezra 3. This is monumental. This is huge. It is meant to look and feel like that great day when Solomon presented the finished temple to the people. Yes, in the grand scheme of things, those two days cannot be compared. But this does not stop the people from trying to have those two days mirror one another as best as possible. Even the confession in verse 10 is the same as it was on that glorious day. 2 Chronicles 7, 3 says, When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks, saying, For he is good, 
for his steadfast love endures forever. The overall setting and experience of these two gatherings may have changed, but the confession and the truth that it conveyed did not. The people worship because God is good and because he is filled with steadfast love towards his people. Yes, the old, te- the old temple was awesome. Yes, it, that day that it was dedicated was one of the greatest days in Israel's history. There was fire coming down from heaven. There was gold likely b- beaming off of the sunlight. There was great sacrifices. Israel was seeing the promise made all the way back to Abraham being fulfilled right before their very eyes. However, the differences between that day and this one in Ezra 3 has no bearing on who the Lord is and what he has done for his people. Even though everything else had changed, the Lord had not. For it was the Lord who preserved a remnant of his people even after judgment in faithfulness to his covenant. It was the Lord who stirred up the spirit of Cyrus a pagan king allowing the Israelite exiles to go home. It was the Lord who also moved Cyrus to send them with the vessels of the temple as they went back. And it was the Lord who strengthened his people to rebuild the altar and start making sacrifices on it. The people could not help but praise and give thanks as they considered all that the Lord had done. They united their voices in worship, along with the voices of Israel throughout the generations before. We know that Israel had many confessions, much like we the church today have many confessions, many of them the same. Next to the Shema, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, in Deuteronomy 6, this one here is probably the second most familiar. It is repeated or alluded to in many of the Psalms. The people of God, as they gathered together throughout the generations, repeatedly would have sang this refrain. The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And many people, I would agree with them, think that this responsive song that is mentioned in verse 11 was likely Psalm 136, which begins with this confession. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. And then from there, each verse gives a declaration about God to which the people would respond, for his steadfast love endures forever. And this continues on for 26 verses. 26 times the people of God respond with, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And that psalm retells critical parts of Israel's history, building to this climactic repeat, give thanks to the God of heaven. His steadfast love endures forever. By the end, you can understand then how in Ezra 3, there is this euphoric shouting of the people. It was joyful. It was emotional. It was loud. If you have ever been to a sporting event you know this type of joyful shout. It is a response to what you are seeing unfold before your eyes. I remember being at a Philadelphia Eagles playoff game in high school. You may be familiar with the game where the Eagles famously converted a fourth and 26 with under two minutes to go. For you football fans, you know that's a pretty significant thing. They eventually tied the game on that drive on a field goal and won in overtime. And despite not being an Eagles fan, I have to correct him from a sermon a few weeks ago, I am confusingly a Panthers fan, I could not help but join in that jubilant shouting and screaming and joy and euphoria. I think it was one of the loudest things, shoutings, I have ever been a part of. And it was also the day where I learned that it is okay and sometimes even appropriate to hug complete strangers. The sub-zero temperatures of that day no longer mattered. The fact that I could not feel my fingers or my toes was irrelevant. I was shouting at the top of my lungs with joy, just like everyone else. 
That is what Ezra records, the people shouting with a great shout at the foundation being laid of the temple. This language also echoes Joshua 6, right before the walls of Jericho come down, where the people have just spent their time circling the city seven times and then blow their trumpets and shout a loud, triumphant shout. There is intense joy and jubilation. There is great delight. There is celebrating all that the Lord has done for His people. And even something as seemingly insignificant as a foundation being laid. Think of it in our day, just a concrete slab laying in the middle of an open field is tangible proof of God's abundant goodness to His people. It could only lead to singing and giving thanks. It didn't matter if the job wasn't complete yet. It didn't matter that some Israels remained in exile. It didn't matter that the throne continued to sit unoccupied. The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. He is the generous giver. He is the covenant keeper. And we today gather under similar circumstances. Yes, the work is not finished. We just sang about it. We are still waiting the fullness of our redemption. We are, as 1 Peter tells us in his letter, exiles waiting to go home. And yet our confession is the same. The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Our joy is the same. And technically, our joy is even greater because of the obedient life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we know without a shadow of a doubt the goodness of the Lord and the extent of His steadfast love for His people. Because it is in His goodness and His love that He sent Christ to take the punishment for our sin, to exchange His righteousness for our filthy rags, And He has adopted us as His beloved children for all eternity. How can we say anything but God is good and His steadfast love endures forever? He has done what we could never do. He has been faithful to His covenant without wavering, unlike us who waver day in and day out. And He has given us His very spirit, His life-giving spirit to dwell within us. And we have the promise that we will one day be glorified in His presence. We will dwell, as a book I've been reading, in the unbridled goodness and love God has for His people. The veil will be taken away and we will experience the goodness and love of God in its full display. Right there is enough joy to fuel our worship, joyful worship, for this life and the next. Which then begs the question, does it? Do we gather week in and week out waiting, anticipating eagerly to joyfully sing and declare the goodness of our God? Do we lift our voices with our brothers and sisters here in the presence, those on the live stream and those around the world to adore the God who loves us eternally in Christ? Are we marked by delight and gladness as we consider and remember who the Lord is and what He has done? The community of God's people worships with great joy in response to the goodness and love of our God. But second, we also see that the people weep. We see this in the second half of verses 12 and 13. While the sight of the new foundation leads some, the young, to rejoice, we see the leaders weep. It says that many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. You get the picture that the few who had likely seen and even had the privilege of worshiping in Solomon's temple 
could not help but feel this deep sadness, even on a great and glorious day as this was. Now the reality of Israel's weeping does present a little bit of a problem. Because the passage provides no moral evaluation of their weeping. There is no statement whether the leaders were in the right or in the wrong for weeping as they did. And the potential problem becomes even more of a problem when we consider two prophets who ministered around this time. Both Haggai and Zechariah allude to events somewhere around this time in their writings. Haggai, in Haggai 2.3, notes the striking contact, contrast between the former and the current temples. And he said the people were guilty of viewing it as nothing in their eyes. There is a sense that this kind of weeping was, was a consideration that this new temple was nothing significant. It was a cardboard box compared to what the old temple was. Their weeping then was out of a, a sense of dissatisfaction or disappointment. And similarly, Zechariah 4.10, he rebukes the people who despise the day of small things, referring to the work of Zerubbabel. He, he tells them they outright despise the day. He takes it a little bit further. But it's hard to say what either of these two prophets are specifically referring to. Some say it's definitely this passage here in Isaiah chapter 3, because there's a link of weeping. Others say it's pointing more to the completion three chapters later of the temple in Ezra 6. There's no mention of weeping, but with the time passing between chapter 3 and chapter 5, we see the entrance of Haggai and Zechariah and their ministry. But regardless of exactly what those prophets were specifically speaking to, there is something in this idea of the people weeping that should both encourage and challenge us today. The encouragement is that the people of God can and do rightfully weep when they gather together. We are not called to be Stoics in our everyday lives or in the regular gatherings as the body. We can weep. We can be filled with sorrow. We can lament individually and together. Tim encouraged us two weeks ago when he preached on Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Without a doubt, the people listed in verse 12 mourned over why Israel was where she was. Returning home from exile without a king or a temple. Certainly there were those in that group who knew it was Israel's apostasy, their idolatry, their outright rebellion that led to her destruction. They knew that God had given his people exactly what he promised should they turn their backs on him. So while the Lord was good to bring them back, things were still not right. Former glories were gone. Certain blessings were strikingly absent, and they had only their sin to blame. We weep and we mourn for similar reasons as we gather. Each of us has indwelling sin. It causes real problems. It does real significant damage. It remains an affront to our holy God. There is also sin in our midst corporately as we gather. We're not as united as we should be, failing to grasp exactly the depths of our union together in Christ. We put the needs of ourselves over the needs of the body. And as we confessed just moments ago, we don't take advantage of opportunities presented to us to serve one another and to serve those around us. On top of all that, there's sin in this world. We see this daily. Life is not treated as sacred. People kill one another, hate one another, exploit one another. Injustice abounds. Greed, immorality, abuse, despising authority, gossip, slander, the list goes on, are everywhere. 
We bring all of this with us when we gather together as the body of Christ. We feel the heaviness, some of us more so than others, because of circumstances, because of situations. And then, on top of all of that, we also bring the grief of the effects of sin. Death, sickness, pain, and loss. And so like Israel, we weep because we see that things are not how they should be. We weep because we know restoration is coming and we long for it to get here. And so Ezra 3 invites us to come and weep. Even as other members may be coming with great joy and delight, we can come with our sorrow. We sang it together in the opening hymn. I'll repeat it for you because when we sing, we sometimes miss it. Where it says, Come those whose joy is morning sun, the worshipers with joy, and those who weep through the night. Come those who tell of battles won and those struggling in the fight. The joyful in our midst need not feel guilty or ashamed of their joy. There is no hint that the younger generation felt that or should have felt that but neither should those who come with weeping feel ashamed of their sorrow just as the joyful sing and confess and profess and listen in their joy so should the sorrowful sing confess profess listen in their sorrow it is not less of an act of worship Scripture is filled with saints who worship the Lord in great times of sorrow, even in the gathering of God's people. Even our Savior did it. Where we know before the garden he was deeply troubled in soul, he and his disciples go to the garden singing together hymns of joy. So that's the encouragement of us as we gather that we can weep because things are not the way they should be. But the challenge does come as we consider the words of Haggai and Zechariah. Whether speaking directly to this event or not, the prophets challenge us when we are tempted to weep without hope, without recognizing that God is still at work in our midst, without confessing that even in our sorrow and our grief, God is still good. Those Levites weeping over the sin and the misery of Israel that caused this, They should be commended. Those weeping because that day meant nothing, those weeping because they despised that day, should have been rebuked. It was wrong if they could not see their own sin and God's faithful response to it. It was wrong if they could not see the goodness of the Lord, even in that unassuming foundation being laid. It was wrong if they could not taste the steadfast love of the Lord in the physical presence of the people of God back in the land, gathering together as his people. Matthew Henry in his commentary writes about this passage, whatever our condition is, however many so, however, how many, he's got flowery language, how many soever our griefs and fears Let it be owned that God is good, and whatever fails, that his mercy fails not. Let this be sung with application as here. Not only his mercy endures forever, but it endures forever towards Israel. Israel went captives in a strange land and strangers in their own land. Don't get me wrong, this is not easy. Seeing the goodness of the Lord in the midst of our sorrow takes the help of His Spirit. Confessing His steadfast love through our tears can only be done by His strength. And one of the ways He strengthens us is when we gather with the body. We see those who were once weeping, now shouting with great shouts of joy. We witness how the Lord has been faithful, as Psalm 34 tells us, to draw near to the brokenhearted and save the crushed in spirit. So if this is you this morning, 
The Lord invites you to bring your sorrow. You need not hide it. As it did in Ezra 3, it blends almost in a beautiful way with the shouts of joy of God's people together glorifying his name. The passage ends with, so the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful from the sound of the people's weeping. And it was heard from far away. And it is this type of blending of the weeping and the worshiping, or should I say the weeping and the joyful, that will continue until the day of joyful consummation. When Christ will come for his bride and put an end to all sin, death, sickness, and sorrow. Again, we see the truth of Jesus Christ here, even in this text. God's restoration project of his people did not end in Ezra 3 or even in Ezra 6 when the temple was finished. As, these two, as the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, two books that go very closely together, unfold, we read of all the wonderful things that happen, wonderful things that confirm the goodness of the Lord and his steadfast love as the people return to the land. They repent of their sin. They rebuild. They renew their covenant. They even reinstitute the Passover and the feasts. They return to the Lord. And yet they still struggle. They stumble and they fall. They sin. They learn that they need more than the loudest of shouts and the deepest of weepings. We thankfully know the end of the restoration project. It is Jesus Christ. It is He, the one who guarantees what Psalm 126, verse 5 proclaims that those who sow in tears will reap shouts of joy. We, the people of God, we can weep as we gather, knowing that God remains good and that His steadfast love endures forever. We have all come to gather together this morning. Whether you are here in person or you're with us via the live stream, you are here to worship. For some, praising the Lord for His goodness and love this morning has been an absolute delight. Your voice has been raised with joy. If we were not wearing a mask, everyone could see your smiling face and love it. And I pray that all of us, regardless of our condition as we come in, we're able to rejoice with you. To follow the words of Paul in Romans 12, 15, to rejoice with those who rejoice. For others, praising the Lord this morning for his goodness and love has been a real struggle. Your voice has been raised in sorrow if you had the strength to raise it at all. You may be glad you're wearing a mask so no one can see your face of sorrow. I pray that all of us, whether we're rejoicing, we're able to weep with you. To follow the other half of Paul's words to, Roman, to the Romans in 12.15. To weep with those who weep. Ezra 3 is not simply a historical text telling us what the people of God did thousands of years ago. It is certainly that, but much more. It is an invitation for us as individuals and as the body of Christ to come with our joy and our sorrow when we worship. It has been the sound of God's people throughout the generations. And it will continue to be the sound until the day the trumpet sounds and Christ comes for his bride. So let us not lose heart if we're in the midst of sorrow. Or as the author of Hebrews admonishes, let us not neglect meeting together, whether we're in joy and sorrow, as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day nearing. We encourage one another whenever we gather to worship. Whether in joy or in sorrow, we, the people of God, gather to praise his name for his abundant goodness to us. Let us pray. Father God, you are good. We have confessed it multiple times this morning in singing, in words of confession. And God, your steadfast love endures forever. We know that chiefly 
in Christ. And we thank you for him. Thank you for his death, for his resurrection, for the fact that there is a day of consummation that we are waiting. And so, God, I pray that as we, the, your people, gather together week in and week out, this morning as well, that we would come with our joy, with our sorrow, and together lift our voices, confess our praises, and exalt your name, and that you would be glorified. Encourage those of us who need encouragement. Revive those who need revival. But God, unite us together, whether in joy or sorrow, to praise you for your goodness and your love. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn of response, and as we prepare to take of the Lord's table, is there is a fountain filled with blood, looking at the cross and Christ's sacrifice. And so we're going to sing the first two verses before we partake of the Lord's Supper. Um, but please, if you would, we can remain seated. Let's remain seated as we th- sing the first two uh, verses of There is a Fount Filled with Blood. Scripture tells us in Mark chapter 14, and as they were eating, he, Jesus, took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of heaven. We come this morning to the table, a meal that is meant to strengthen, to encourage the body of Christ. Whether we come with joy over tasting and seeing the goodness of the Lord over the past week or month, we come to feast. Whether we come with joy because it's been difficult to see the goodness of the Lord and taste His steadfast love, we come to eat and to feast together. Because as Paul tells us, this table will continue to be the table until the Lord comes and does away with all sickness, sorrow, pain, and death. And so this table is a picture of that great day and also a reminder of the sacrifice of Christ to forgive our sin, to begin this restoration project of His, of his people. And so this table is for those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, those who seek then to walk in obedience to his word. And so if that is you this morning, whether you're a member of Covenant Presbyterian Church, the PCA or not, the Lord himself invites you to come. But if you're here this morning and you are not sure where you are with with Christ and what all this talk is about the cross and his death and his blood, then may I encourage you just to observe and to watch his people as we worship him together by feasting at his table. But also, for all of us who are in Christ, there is a reminder that as we come, we are to do so in reverence. We are to come examining ourselves. We've already confessed our sins earlier this this service. And so even as I pray to bless these elements, 
Uh, maybe the Lord has convicted you, particularly in, in light of his word being preached. Take that moment then to examine and to confess again any sin before the Lord. But let us pray. Father God, we come to you, to your table. And we don't presume to come here trusting in our own righteousness, trusting in any goodness that we bring, but we come trusting in your abundant and your great mercies, trusting in the fact that you are good and your steadfast love endures forever. Because God, we confess that in our sin, in and of ourselves, we are not worthy to even gather up the crumbs that fall from this, your table. But you are the same Lord who delights in showing mercy to sinners like us. Would you grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, to so eat of this bread and drink of this wine that we may feed on Christ in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray this in his name. Amen. Scripture tells us the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. As I am ministering in his name, give this bread to you. And also, it says that he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many. And he gave it to his disciples. So if you would, peel the top and take that wafer. And hear the Lord as he invites, he says, take, eat. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the scripture tells us in the same manner he also took the cup. Having given thanks has been done in his name, he gave it to his disciples. Again, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the many for the remissions of sin. Drink of it, all of you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for calling us out of the darkness and into your glorious light, for displaying your goodness and your steadfast love to us. When we remember the price you paid, the death of your only son, we can only wonder and marvel at the greatness of your love. We give our lives to you, Lord, and pray that through your spirit you would teach us how to live according to your will. Would you send us now, out now to love and to serve you as faithful witnesses of your mercy, declaring your goodness and your steadfast love to any and all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would please, as our song of closing, stand and let us together sing the last three verses of There is a Fount Filled with Blood.
and now receive the Lord's benediction. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever till the day of eternity. Amen.